Good. All right, so take your Bible and open to Acts chapter 6. <laughs> we looked last, the last time we were together at the first deacons and what their role was, and also looking at the characteristics of the church and characteristics that we should have today as a church, the things that we should be emulating that we saw in the first church and the things that Christ established in his walk on earth when he set up the church and, and those things. So we've been talking about these characteristics, and we want to keep looking at those. And one of the things that we've seen was a, was a characteristic of boldness. We, we've seen seen this several times. We've seen boldness in um, uh, sharing the gospel. We've seen boldness in the face of resistance. And did that just die out again? So is it bouncing on, on the thing? It's so if I talk, if I stop talking, it stops bouncing? So the other thing that you can do is get the headphones, plug them into that little mixer where it says phones, and you'll hear whether or not sound is transferring. So those of you who are watching, uh, we're having some technical issues. We're trying to make sure that it doesn't die again. And I do have a mic that's supposed to be on its way. It's back ordered. So we have a replacement coming. So as long as that is still playing, I'm going to keep going. Okay, so we've seen boldness in the face of opposition. We've seen boldness in, in the face of even physical assault, the threat of jail, um, and things like that. But the question comes, we, we see all this, but then we, the question comes, um, will we have it even in the face of torture and death? And so we, we've seen all this, and then comes Stephen. Stephen's one of the first deacons. He is he is just going about doing his thing. He is, he is um, and I want you to notice as we look at this, because the next couple of chapters are going to cover him, we're going to cover Philip, and I'm sorry, distractions kind of got me off kilter a little bit there. Um, you follow some of the things that we see in the deacons. That's just going to be crazy, isn't it? <laughs> follow some of the things we see in the deacons, and um, you know, what, we're, what we're going to see is the features of the deacons, that they were preachers. They weren't pastors. They were assistants to the pastor. They weren't pastors, but they were preachers. They were evangelists. And those are characteristics that deacons today need to have. And those are also, by the way, characteristics that each of us should have. Now, and I know we, we kind of start choking and going, but preachers, preacher, no, 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 preacher, that's the guy in the pulpit. That's a preacher is a messenger. That's it. That's all preaching means. The office of bishop as an overseer, that's a different ball game. Every human being who has trusted Christ as their Savior has become a witness, a preacher, a messenger of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we are all to be preachers. We are all to be out in the community preaching, teaching, sharing, whatever word you want, testifying of the greatness of God and the wonderful grace that comes with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, so Stephen, one of the deacons, he's doing that. So we pick up in verse 8 this morning. Stephen is just being Stephen. Deacon, servant of God, working miracles, tending to the people of God. What could possibly go wrong with this? Maybe some religious people? So we pick up in verse 8, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, some of the church, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and the Cyrenians, the Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Father, uh, you know all the things going on this morning. This is all in your control, all up to you. This is your place, your time, everything. And so, Father, whether our equipment works or not, it doesn't change the power of your word, the presence of your spirit, or anything else about you. So, Father, I pray that you'd help us, and especially me, not be distracted by the things that are going on around us, and that we would be focused on your word, that you would help me to stay in tune with you, to keep my eyes on you and to share the message that you've given me and that we would just enjoy your presence and learn about your word and gain some knowledge in what all we need to be doing as children of God and as a church in particular. So, Father, we just pray for your blessings this morning and all that goes on, your strength, your power, and your focus. So, Father, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, miracles come only from God, correct? 
So here, Stephen, deacon, is out doing miracles. And, and I, I love this because, you know, John makes this clear in, in chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, when he's talking to Nicodemus, it says there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, teacher, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. Why? For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And, and the thing I want us to focus on this morning as our characteristics is God was with him. Because this is the biggest piece of the whole story. God is with us. God was with Stephen. God was with him. Keep that thought in your mind as we go through some of this and we see these characteristics. Stephen and all these characters that we look at, their boldness didn't come because they were just mighty men and ravishing strong. God was with them. And so Stephen, he's just going around, he's doing miracles and wonders, he's preaching, he's doing all the things that he's supposed to be doing, and now people in the synagogue, a new group that we haven't really focused on yet in Scripture, jumps up, and they're going to dispute with him now. They're going to correct him. I, I'm sure this was a, I'm sure this was approached as a nice, friendly, let me sit you down, Stephen, and, and help you understand the better way, a more excellent way, uh, because I think you got this confused. I'm sure it was very pleasant, aren't you? It says there arose this group, and I wonder if they just all sort of came up at the same time, or if one of them started and said, you know, we got to do something about this guy. You know, you're right. Hey, I know this guy from Cilicia over here, too, and he's really got a lot of Bible knowledge. Let's get him, and let's get Joe over here from this other place, and the Cyrenians. Let's get them all together. But the true wisdom only comes from God. Romans 11 and verse 33 says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Luke 21 verse 14, Jesus is speaking to them to, when he's sending them out. He says, settle it therefore in your hearts. Man, I love that phrase right there. Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what ye shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay or re nor resist. So Stephen is just trusting God. He's preaching. He's doing the things. They sit down to dispute with him, and I love this. They were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. He's just living out God's promise right here. Jesus said, this is how it's going to be. Don't worry about what you're going to say. Don't try to figure out beforehand. Don't try to, don't try to have your pat statements ready to go. I'll give you what you need in the moment that you need it. I'll give you my wisdom. I'll give you my words. You'll be just fine. And those that oppose you won't be able to do anything against you. They won't be argued. They're not going to be able to resist your logic, your spirit. So just let me have it. Let me take care of it. It's a good message for us today. Sometimes I think we get scared to go out and truly evangelize or sow in because we're afraid we don't have enough Bible knowledge or we won't know what to say or, well, I'm not real good with people. I, I'm, not, I'm not real good at getting into the conversation. I'm not real good at, and we give excuses. And Jesus said, don't even take thought of that. Don't think about what you're going to say before you go. I'll take care of it. You just go. And in the moment, I'll tell you what to say. I've shared with you the testimony of the, of the young man that started all the bus routes at the time when I, when I went to Roland Road. The guy who started every single bus route, and I think there was eight when we got there, and he was one of those bashful guys, you know, kind of the, the arm sniffing, you know, hi, I'm from Roland Road, and if you, we got a bus, if you want to ride now, that's okay. He wasn't what anybody would call the great orator. He was just a servant of God who was willing to go out, and he did what he could do, and he just kept building bus routes and building bus routes and building bus routes. He said, we don't need to worry about this stuff. All we need to worry about is, are we being obedient to God? And if we are, great, God will take care of everything else. Go out and talk to people. God will turn to conversations. God will give us the words that we need to say. All we have to do is go out there and do this. So these guys are sitting there. They're debating with him. And they can't resist his. They can't resist his speech. They can't resist anything that he's saying. <laughs> so that didn't work. So what's next? Oh, let's go find some others now. So in verse eleven, he says, "Then they suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God.' And they stirred up the council 
and set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place. Keep that thought in your mind right there. And the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel, because God was with him. God was with him in the first debate. God is still with him. They've called him. They've drugged him. They've made all these accusations. And I love this. The high priest then says, are these things so? Do you think maybe the high priest was in on this little game? He was on all the others, right? There's always, always, always going to be resistance to the gospel. We all want the experience of going out, telling somebody about Jesus, and them trusting Christ, and everything being all great and wonderful and tears and joy and all that. But the real truth is the vast majority of the time is going to be resistance and rejection. And Jesus said this early on. He, 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 do you remember he explained to us that there's a, there's a wide path that leads to destruction, a narrow path that leads to life? And there's a whole lot of people that are going to find the wide path. But there's only a few people that are going to find the narrow path. There's only a few people who are going to trust Christ. There's only a few people overall who are going to get it and trust Jesus and find eternal life. There's going to be a wide swath of people who reject Christ, who deny his existence or deny his salvation, and they're going to find themselves in eternal damnation in a place called hell. Jesus said this is how it's going to be. Man has a free will, and there's always, there will always be a number, a greater number of men and women who choose to reject Christ than those who choose to accept him. Part of that is our pride. We do not want to humble ourselves to the point that we acknowledge that we are sinners in need of a Savior, that we are guilty before God. Do you realize when Jesus said, I did not come to condemn you, he didn't need to come to condemn us. We were condemned already. Jesus didn't come to condemn us. We are already in that position. Remember what he told Nicodemus in chapter 3 when he got over and talked about for God so loved the world, and we, we have the wonderful verse there that we memorize. But after that he said, For he that believeth is saved, but he that believeth not is condemned already. He didn't come to condemn. He came to call sinners to righteousness. He came to call sinners to repentance. He came to rescue the lost house of Israel back to the glory that God intended and through that to draw all men to himself by the sacrifice of his son. And for us to be saved, there's nothing we can do to earn salvation, to gain salvation. But we do have to reach a place where we understand that we are sinners, and nothing we can do can get us to heaven. Our best 10 seconds on this earth is not enough to get us to heaven because we're born in sin. I've said it 100,000 times. It seems like I'm going to say it until I die another 100,000 times if I can get away with it, that we do not become sinners because we do something bad. We do bad things because we are born sinners. And it is hard for man to swallow that truth. It's hard for us as humans to admit, I'm born this way and nothing I can do about it. Except trust Jesus. I can't buy, beg, I can't barter, nothing. I can either trust Christ or I reject Christ. And the vast majority, the overwhelming numbers, are going to be those who reject Christ. Not what God wants. The Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but all come to salvation. It is not God's desire. It's all up to us. God has already done everything required to provide us eternal life. He gave his son to die on a cross. His son went to the cross, living a perfect life, kept the law to the nth degree, and was sacrificed for others, not himself. 
and then God raised him from the dead. He lives forevermore as the Savior of the world. We must accept that. But we also must accept as children of God that the bulk of people we talk to are going to reject Christ. And if we're not careful, we're going to view that as rejection of ourselves. We don't want to go through the rejection. We don't want to go through the difficulty. We don't want to go. They're not rejecting us. They're rejecting Jesus. We need to acknowledge it. We need to understand that. And we need to not let that hinder us in us going out and telling people about Jesus Christ. We need to understand that there is going to be resistance to the gospel. And that resistance may even come in the form of persecution, torture, and death. This is how it goes. And so Stephen is being resisted. But as they're looking at him, they see him, and he's like the face of an angel because God is with him. And no matter what we're doing, if we're out testifying of Christ and things are starting to get ugly, remember God is with us. We don't have to sweat it. None of this stuff do we have to worry about. So he's, he's sitting here. They brought him up. The, the, the priest is asking, the high priest is asking him, you know, is this true? Can't you just see, Stephen? I'm glad you asked. Verse 2 of chapter 7. He says, and he said, men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto Father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran, Haran or Charan, the, the, the Karan, I'm not sure how the Greek pronounces that, but it's Haran, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into the land which I will show thee. They came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and went into Karan, and thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. And he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for possession to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. And God spake on this wise, that, this seed, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land, and they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil four hundred years. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God, and after that they shall come forth and serve me in this place, and he gave them the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day. And Isaac begat Jacob. And Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Notice there's no delay. The high priest says, is this true? And Stephen is instant to start sharing. He doesn't wait. He's ready to preach. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13 says, Who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord thy God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, that's a reverence, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. And that word conversation means your life, your testimony. Stephen was instant. The opportunity arose he was having a nice little discussion, nice, friendly little chit-chat. That didn't go the way they wanted it, so they raised up a bunch of people to get a bunch of junk going. They get him before the Pharisee and the Sanhedrin and all these other people, all these leaders, and they're now they're going to grill him, and they're making false accusations. They're outright lying about him. And the high priest says, is this so? And Stephen doesn't wait. He doesn't take a breath. He just starts preaching. He said, men, brethren, listen. And so he starts at the place of their knowledge and goes on from there. This is a great technique to learn right here. And this is also wonderful for Stephen. It's important for him to start back this far because, remember, he is a Grecian Jew, so he's not one of the holy Hebrews. He's a Grecian Jew, and he needs to establish before this great body of his biblical knowledge. But more than that, 
He's starting with the things they know best. And he's going to start there, and he's going to work his way to the gospel. He's going to work his way in truth. So he reviews what they know. He starts with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the patriarchs. Now remember, all through the centuries, God has come through the prophets to Israel saying, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he throws these names out. He shows where they're at. He points out their rejection of Joseph, who is God's chosen. Remember, even before they sold him into slavery, he was seeing visions. He was having visions that he was going to lead. He was going to be over the family, even though he was the junior guy of all the brothers. He was going to be leading things, and they didn't like that. They could see that he was God's chosen, but they rejected God's chosen. But God was with him. Verse 11, now there came a dearth over all the land of Egypt and Canaan and great affliction, uh, and our fathers found the, the, uh, no sustenance. <clears throat> but when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out the fathers first, and at the second time Joseph was made known to his brethren, and Joseph's kindred was made known unto Pharaoh. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him, and all his kindred, threescore and fifteen souls. So Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers, <coughs> excuse me, and were carried over into Shechem and laid in the sepulcher that Abraham bought for a sum of money, the sons of Emor, the father of Shechem. So he got them down into Egypt. He's walking them through their history. Here's Abraham call. Here's how the 12 got here. Now we've got them down into Egypt. Famine has hit the land. And surprise, surprise, God's chosen shows up again as the savior of the people in the famine. So the family is in Egypt. Jacob is dead. We're moving on. Verse 17, but when the time of the promise drew nigh, that's an important statement right there. When the time of the promise drew nigh, which God has sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. The same dealt subtly with our kindred and evil and treated our fathers so that they cast out their young children to the end they might not live in which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up at his, in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. But they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove, and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren, why do ye wrong one another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at this saying, and was a stranger in Lad of Midian, where he begat two sons. So watch this setup that's this going on now. This is one of the most remarkable set, setups that I've ever seen. He is setting them up for the ultimate truth. And, and listen, this is not done in a conniving way. This is done to point out the consistencies and inconsistencies in the history of Israel and the leaders of Israel, and to understand human nature. So he's setting up. He's got this setup coin. He starts with when the time of the promise drew nigh. So we have a main event coming up. Here's what all is happening. So it's time to fulfill the promise and go into the promised land. Now comes Moses. God's chosen. He is rejected. Now granted, Moses didn't help things when he killed the Egyptian trying to trying to get the people out by his own strength instead of trusting God to do it. He didn't help things, but still yet, he is God's chosen. So God was with him. Even though he killed the guy and he left, um, he, was, he had been preserved initially. He was raised in Pharaoh's home, and he was taken care of in the desert for the next 40 years. Verse 30, and when the 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and he drew near to behold it. And a voice of the Lord called out to him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers. Here he is again, the God of Abraham, 
and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled and durst not behold. He didn't look up. Then said the Lord to him, Put off the shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the, of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after, they had, after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness forty years. Stephen is now established the holy encounter, the holy encounter on the mountain, clearly showing Moses is called of God, chosen by God to be the leader. He did miracles, and he, he, he makes this really detailed. He did miracles in Egypt, he did miracles in, in the Red Sea, and he did miracles in the wanderings throughout the desert. God was with him. Keep watching. The setup is about to come to fruition. Verse 37, this is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai, and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us, to whom our fathers would not obey. But thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt, saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we know not, we, we want not what is become of him. And they made a calf in those days, and offered sacrifice to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Here we go again. Rejecting God's chosen. He's got this set up. God called this one. God's chosen, rejected, God's chosen, rejected, God's chosen, rejected. Then God turned, verse 42, and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of prophets. O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of forty years in the wilderness? Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch, and the star of your God Raphim, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away to Babylon." rejected God's chosen, turned back to idol worship. Verse 44, our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, and he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David, who found favor with God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. Now remember the accusation before. They were speaking blasphemies against this holy place, the temple, and against the law. So now he's going to give them the temple. He's got them in the tabernacle. He's moved them into the temple. Uh-oh. The fathers had the tabernacle. The Pharisees have the temple. We've got all this stuff going. I'm sure they're feeling kind of pompous right now because that was them. That was all them. And we had the tabernacle. They had the, they had the, uh, they had the tabernacle. We've got the temple. This is God's place. And we're the ones allowed to be in it. We're the chosen. We're the holy few. We're it. Verse 48. Howbeit, the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me? Saith the Lord. Or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? <laughs> there it is. We just reached the top of the pool hill. You ever been on a big roller coaster? You can't see anything but sky. And, it, and you get to the top and you kind of slowly, and then all of a sudden, and everybody starts screaming and puking. 
grabbing each other, grabbing hair. Some are crazy enough to throw their hands up. <laughs> no. We just started the plummet right there. We hit the top of the hill, and here's the plummet. After all, they had the temple, the holy centerpiece of their glory, and he just said, according to the prophets, God said, really, you're going to build a house for me? I, I'm, where, where, where are you going to build that I'm going to dwell in? Heaven is my playground. Earth is my footstool. What, what is it you're going to contain me with? Verse 51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they that have slain them which slew them before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. This is their entire claim to fame. We keep the law. We know the law. And here Stephen says, you've gotten it, and you don't even keep it. There's a the hammer. He established a pattern. God chose, the people rejected, did things on their own. The patriarchs rejected Joseph, but God was with him. Moses was chosen first. In, 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 uh, God, Moses was chosen but tried first in his own way and failed, but God was still with him. Then Moses followed God, went back, threw people out of Egypt, and they rejected him, but God was with him. They got the tabernacle. It became the end all. They got the temple. It became the end all. We have churches and denominations, and it's become the end all. In our particular work, we put the church over Jesus Christ. We have made so much about the church that we've forgotten that it's about Jesus and not about the church. And, and he's going to hair lip some folks, but I got news for us. God did not send the witnesses out and tell them go into every town and testify and plant missionary Baptist churches. He said, go out and tell them about Jesus when the lost. That's what we're told to do. This building is not the pinnacle. This church organization is not the pinnacle. Jesus is the pinnacle. Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's always all been about Jesus. It will always be about Jesus. Jesus is God's chosen, the sacrifice for sin, the creator of the universe, the one who chose to come in human flesh and die for our sins. It's always about Jesus. And we're going to see it even more clearly. When they heard these things, verse 54, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. God was with him. Stephen is now being physically assaulted and tortured. They're biting him. They're gnashing on him. They're, they're just, they're just you know, they can't stand it. They're so angry because there's no defense. There is nothing they can say. This is why people get so angry at us when we bring the gospel. Because when we finally come face to face with personal sin and a holy God, and if they don't want to yield to that, it makes them angry that they've got to give an account to somebody, and they don't want to, they can't do it in their strength. It always creates an issue. And here, they have been cut to the quick. He has laid out the entire history of Israel from Abraham to Jesus Christ and how Israel has consistently rejected the leaders, killed the prophets, killed the prophets, killed the prophets, and now they were just informed. He said, we can't, we can't handle this. They chew on him. They're angry at him. And in the midst of this, Stephen is not in the fetal position screaming and cowering. He looks steadfastly into heaven because the heavens open up to him. 
the God who has been with him the entire time now makes his presence visible to his eyes. He now sees the one who has been empowering him, who has been helping him, who has been holding him, who has been comforting him, who has been giving him the words to say, who has been the real wisdom that nobody could argue with. He now sees him standing at the right hand of God. He sees the glory of God, and to his right, he sees Jesus Christ standing, ready to receive him. He cries out, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Don't you think that should have made him go, oh, whoa, 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 what are we doing here? Wait a minute, what are we doing here? He's seeing God. What's, what's, what are we doing? We need to stop. We need to stop what we're doing. No. Verse 57, they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears. And, oh, I can't hear this. They ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So they're stoning him. And instead of screaming back, instead of ranting back, instead of trying to argue, he just says, Lord, receive my spirit. He wasn't crying, going, oh, I don't want to die, I don't want to die. Look, I'll renounce, I'll renounce, just stop throwing rocks. I, I, won't, I won't talk about him anymore. No, Stephen goes, Lord, I'm ready. Let's go. Receive my spirit. I'm good. He kneeled down, cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. I want to make sure everybody heard. He was praying for them. The last word Stephen speaks on this earth is begging God to forgive those that are stoning him. God was there. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Saul was consenting unto his death. It is believed Saul was part of the Sanhedrin at this time. And that's the reason this statement is here. Because you couldn't put anybody to death without the consent of the Sanhedrin. And Paul is not just holding their coats, but he's consenting. He's giving authority to their killing of Stephen. They can't take it anymore. But God was with them. Listen, why do we, we resist? Why, as the people of God, do we resist? Why do we find it so hard to just go do what we're told? To go testify, to go tend to people. Why is it we are so comfortable? And we don't want to do anything that gets us out of our standard way of operation. I don't want to go out. I don't want to get anybody offended at work. I don't want to, I don't want to get fired because I'm one of those Jesus people. Have you seen any example yet of somebody who served God that God abandoned and just let them struggle out there? I mean, in the first few chapters, we see Christians, people who have accepted Christ, who have lost everything because simply because they trusted Christ and made it publicly known. They've been fired. They've been kicked out of properties that they were leasing or making payments on. They, they've lost everything. And what did God do? He just grouped all the ones that still had money and jobs together, and, and they took care of them until they could find some other way to take care of themselves. Have you ever seen God forsake his people? Isn't that the promise he made? I will never leave you nor forsake you. I, all those that I receive, I will no wise cast out. I mean, how many things do we have to have by God to tell us we don't have to worry about this stuff? We've seen them threatened, and they went on preaching. We've seen them smacked around, beat, and they went on preaching. We've seen them thrown in jail, and they went on preaching. Now we've seen one tortured and killed, and he just kept on preaching. Right until the last moment when he said, Hey, check this out. I see Jesus. Lord, don't lay this sin against their church. Doesn't that sound kind of familiar? Wasn't it Jesus on the cross 
having been tortured beyond measure, already beaten till the muscles came loose from his rib cage, till his intestines were hanging out. He was not recognizable as a man. You couldn't even tell he was a human being up there. And now he's on the cross. If all that was enough, now we got him on a cross. And in the Greek text, the phrase appears to be a repetitive phrase that he was saying over and over, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. Father, forgive them. They know not what they are doing. Stephen decided he's just going to follow Christ, so they tried to ask him to do it. And let him take care of the rest of it. And at the worst possible scenario that we as humans could ever come up with, being beat, stoned, chewed on, physically chewed on, people biting and tearing flesh off your body, in that moment, the greatest, worst things that we could think of, the heavens open, Christ is revealed in person, standing to receive him. Why are we scared to just go door to door and tell people about Jesus? Why are we so scared to tell somebody in Walmart about Jesus? Why are we so scared to take our Bible and read it at a break at work? Why are we so scared to tell people we work with about Jesus? Why are we so scared of anything? God was with them. It was just a piece of a sentence. But it's so profound. They rejected him. But God was with us. If we have trusted Christ, God is with us. Why are we scared? Peter asked, who's going to do something to you if you're doing good for Christ? And if they do, be happy. Paul said, who can lay anything against the Lord's elect? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, is risen is making intercession. Huh. Why are we scared? What are we afraid of? Man? Didn't Jesus tell somebody one time, don't, don't worry about what man can do. Don't worry about a man who can take your life. You need to worry about God who can take your soul. What do we need to be afraid of? Who do we need to be afraid of? We want to see revival. It starts when we put away the fear, and we just obey. It starts when we decide, no more excuses. I'm just going to serve the Lord. And whoever the writer of Hebrews is, and I think it's Paul, just my personal opinion, when he says, we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, this is one of those witnesses that circle around us all these testimonies and centuries of God being with his people. Don't be If you haven't trusted Christ, now's the time. Right now you should be afraid if you've never trusted Jesus, because if you die right now, you're going to be in eternal torment. And there's no end. This isn't a, oh, well, God is going to have mercy on you in a couple of years, a couple of centuries, a couple of thousand millennia, and then you're going to get to go to heaven. It's forever. If you get there, it's forever. And you get there because you chose to get there. You rejected Jesus Christ. So I'm asking you, I'm begging you this morning, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ, this is the time right now. Jesus, save me. I am a sinner. Put your trust in him. I promise you from that moment, and every moment that you live on this earth, God will be with you no matter what. And the beautiful part is, at the end of this life, you go be with Him. Here, He's with us. There, we're with Him. What are you afraid of? Somebody will mock me if I trust you. Who cares? You afraid of man? You afraid of God? Church? The saved of Jesus? What are we afraid of? Let's determine to serve God, no matter what, because God is with us. Father, you know our needs, you know our hearts, and whatever it is that we need to deal with this morning. Whether we need to be encouraged because we're fighting, we're staying in the fight, we're serving you, we're doing the things you've called, 
or we are we are struggling and 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 not able to follow you know what our needs are and you know that you we know that you're the solution to all of us so i pray father this morning that we would we would seek you as the solution and let you take the things that we have and that we that we need to do and help us to do them because you're with us father we pray for anybody who's here or who is watching they don't know jesus today right now is the moment they say jesus save me i am a sinner forgive me and be my savior whatever words they choose to use if they do that you promised that salvation. And so we ask for that this morning. Father, we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. We stand to our